specialized moon transport versus modified all rounder, complex two crew lander versus seat of the pants one seater, or one stander rather. The American and Soviet approaches to landing on the moon couldn't have been more different. Today, we're comparing the Apollo spacecraft and the L3 lunar complex. So, let's get ready to rocket rumble! Hello everybody and welcome! In the previous installment of my Rocket Rumble series, we took a look at the two massive rockets that were designed to launch a moon mission from Earth into space, the Saturn V and the N1. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend watching it, link is in the description and up top. Now that we are in space, we will talk about what ideas and engineering concepts both the United States and the Soviet Union came up with in their quest to win the race to the moon and claim the bragging rights of being first. Just like all you commenters out there. Both approaches split landing and returning from the moon into two vehicles. But that's pretty much where the similarities end. Guess which design involved way more risk than the other? Drop a comment, I'll wait. And while you're down there, if you aren't already, please hit that subscribe button. I really want to reach 100,000 subscribers and I'd appreciate it a lot if you could help me out. Speaking of help, a ton of people helped making the moon landing happen. Of course, we all know what happened historically. The United States was the first nation to reach the surface of the moon in 1969 with Apollo 11. But a couple of years before that, things were not so clear cut. In an alternate universe, maybe the Soviets would have been able to get there faster, just like in the TV series For All Mankind. But did they really have a chance? Let's get this rumble on the way and start with spacecraft design. When NASA developed the Apollo spacecraft, they ended up with a design for a crew of three. It was a bespoke vehicle consisting of the command module, service module and lunar module, purpose-built for the task. The Soviet L3 lunar complex consisted of three vehicles. First, the 7K LOK, with LOK being an acronym for Lunyi Orbitalny Korabl, which is Lunar Orbital Ship in Russian. It was basically a modified Soyuz, consisting of a crew module, re-entry module and service module. The most noticeable difference was the way it generated power. While a normal Soyuz would rely on solar panels, the LOK would use fuel cells, just like the Apollo service module. In addition to this vehicle, the lunar complex included the LK lander, with LK again being an acronym, this time just for moonship, and the Block D propulsion stage. The command and service module measured 11 meters in length and 3.9 meters in diameter, with a total mass of 28.8 tons. The 7K LOK was a bit shorter, just a bit over 10 meters and just 2.9 meters in diameter, weighing in at 9.85 tons. The Apollo missions were designed around a crew of three. The Soviet moon mission would have been performed by just two cosmonauts. Let's move on to the landers. As many of you may know, the Apollo lunar module consisted of two stages, a descent stage and an ascent stage, each with their own engine powered by hypergolic propellant. When still combined, the LM was 7 meters in length and 4.2 meters in diameter with retracted landing gear, widening its footprint to 9.4 meters with the landing gear deployed. Both lander stages combined had a wet mass of 15 tons. The idea was that the descent stage would get the entire craft down to the surface of the moon and that the ascent stage would separate and fly back to lunar orbit. The descent stage would carry science experiments and later also a rover, while the ascent stage would house the crew and return soil samples. Housing the crew might be a misnomer, it was pretty tight in there. In order to control the lander, the astronauts would have to stand for the entire flight. When it came to getting out onto the ladder and stepping onto a strange new world, both crew members would have to get into their spacesuits, empty the compartment's atmosphere and then open the hatch. In order to save weight, there was no airlock. Let's contrast this with the LK lander. It only had room for one cosmonaut, the docking system did not allow for transferring crew, more on that later, and it did not have two propulsion systems. Instead, it was powered by Block Y, which would reignite after the landing, leaving just the landing gear behind. As for the numbers, 
The LK was a lot smaller, standing only at 5 meters tall and roughly as wide with landing gear extended. It was also a lot lighter, coming in at only 5.5 tons. I already mentioned that the Soviet moon mission was designed for just two cosmonauts. That meant that one would remain in orbit, while the other one would pilot the LK lander alone to the surface and back up again. Finishing the Soviet stack was Block D, the maneuvering and descent stage. It alone was bigger than the lander, standing 6.3 meters tall with a diameter of 3.7 meters. Its mass, including propellant, was 17.4 tons. It shared some duties with Apollo's command and service module, as well as the descent stage of the lunar module, since it would perform the lunar orbital insertion, as well as the main descent. In total, the combination of Apollo command and service module and lunar module had a mass of almost 44 tons, while the L3 lunar complex would come in at a bit under 33 tons. Which makes sense, since we established in our previous rocket rumble that the N1 had a significantly lower payload capacity than the Saturn V. Now that we know what we're dealing with, let's look at the mission profiles back to back. First up, we start with the one many of you might already be familiar with. Mission Profile – Apollo as is tradition on this channel, I have recreated the vehicles in Kerbal Space Program. For the Apollo portion of this video, I decided to get probably my most comprehensive Saturn V and Apollo build out of storage and shoot some new footage with modern visual mods. That start sequence does look pretty, and I have an extended cut of this available for YouTube members and Patreon supporters. After the first stage was spent, it was jettisoned, followed by the interstage ring with the second stage taking over. During the ascent, the launch escape system would also be detached to save mass. The last leg to orbit was of course taken over by the third stage, seen here deploying from within the stage 2 fairing. It would later propel the Apollo spacecraft to the moon. The first couple of third stages went past the moon and are now in a heliocentric orbit out there in interplanetary space, but later the stage was directed to impact onto the surface of the moon. After finishing the translunar injection burn, it was time for a maneuver called transposition, docking and extraction. During this the command and service module would detach, flip 180 degrees and dock with the lunar module before extracting it from the fairing of the Saturn's third stage. Unlike the Soviet docking system, Apollo's docking system allowed for crew transfer. Once the vehicle had performed their orbital insertion, the two astronauts slated to land on the moon would crawl into the lander safely and then undock from the command and service module. As already discussed in the previous section, the descent stage would take care of getting the lunar module down onto the moon's grey and dusty surface. The first Apollo moon landings would just carry the two astronauts plus science experiments. And of course the all-important flag! But Apollo 15, 16 and 17 would bring along the lunar roving vehicle, a small four-wheeled car designed to carry the astronauts further so they could gather samples from further away. Kerbals, of course, have a different idea what to do with this type of vehicle. Anyway, once all the samples were brought on board, it was time to go home. The Apollo 17 crew spent a total of 22 hours, 3 minutes and 57 seconds outside of the lunar module, spread across three extravehicular activities during their three-day stay. After stowing all the samples they collected, the ascent stage would fire up and transport the astronauts back into lunar orbit. There, they would rendezvous with the command and service module, dock again, transfer themselves and the collected samples to it, and then the remains of the lunar module would be undocked, left to remain in lunar orbit. Then, of course, the command and service module would perform another burn to return to Earth, where the command part would separate from the service part re-enter the atmosphere and splash down safely in the Pacific Ocean. So now we have that done, let's move to the Soviet plan. Mission Profile L3 Again we start with a massive launch vehicle, the N1. If it had worked, it would have propelled the L3 stack quickly up into the atmosphere before the second stage would take over. As mentioned earlier, 
More details about this are in the previous episode of Rocket Rumble. Unlike the Saturn's third stage, which would also perform the translunar injection burn, the N1's third stage would be spent after delivering everything needed to get to the Moon into orbit. For the Soviet crewed Moon mission, the translunar injection burn would have been performed by Block G, sending the L3 lunar complex on its way. Once at the Moon, Block D would perform the orbital insertion burn, getting the stack into a safe parking orbit. Now it was time for the landing. I told you already, the Soviet docking system, which was called Kontakt, did not enable crew transfer. Instead, a cosmonaut would have to go on an EVA, climb down the side of the LOK vehicle and then enter the LK lander from the outside. For the first Soviet moon landing, this job would have had to be performed by Alexei Leonov, himself already the first man in history who had performed a spacewalk in 1965 and almost died in the process. I did an entire video about that a while back. The story of Voschod 2 is pretty insane. Link is up top and in the description. Let's assume this EVA went without problems this time and the cosmonaut would be safe inside the LK. Then it and Block D would detach from the LK and begin the descent. Block D would cancel out almost all the entire velocity, leaving the LK's Block Y to perform the final burn of roughly 100 meters per second of delta V to complete the landing. As with the Apollo lunar module, the LK pilot would be standing using the concave section to peer outside during the approach. Unlike this KSP recreation, the real LK would use small solid rocket motors to press the landing gear into the lunar surface so it wouldn't bounce back. Since it was a lot smaller than Apollo, the LK could only sustain up to a day of surface operations and return a maximum of 50 kilograms of soil samples. Once it was time to return, Block Y would fire up again and ascend, leaving the no longer needed landing gear apparatus behind. Back in orbit, LK and LOK would again dock, necessitating another EVA for the cosmonaut in the LK lander to get back into the lunar Soyuz vehicle. And just as with Apollo, the lander would be left in orbit and the 7K LOK returned to Earth under its own power separating the crew and service module to burn up in the atmosphere. Just like every other Soyuz landing, the crew would not splash down, but touch down in what is now Kazakhstan. Well, I asked you in the beginning which of the moon missions would be riskier. If you guessed the Soviet one, you would be right. Two EVAs in addition to only one cosmonaut inside the lander made the plan for the L3 lunar complex a lot more dangerous than what NASA was able to come up with also thanks to the power of the Saturn V. But there would have been another option for the Soviet Union to get to the Moon requiring multiple N1 launches. This is something for a separate video though. It's super interesting and reminded me in many ways of what SpaceX wants to do with Starship. Subscribe so you don't miss that when it comes out. Now, let's look at the final comparison in today's Rocket Rumble matchup. Service record. You might think this was a slam dunk win for Apollo, but it is a bit more difficult this time around. You see, the Saturn V, Command and Service Module and Lunar Module combination was a purpose-built moon landing vehicle stack. The Soviets, on the other hand, used more off-the-shelf components where they could. I already mentioned that the LOK vehicle, which stayed in orbit and was designed to return to cosmonauts, was basically a variant of Soyuz, probably the world's most successful spacecraft to date. And the Block D maneuvering and descent stage was used together with the Proton rocket. A lot! The first iteration alone was launched 44 times, with upgraded versions being in service up until today. So while Block D was originally developed for the L3 lunar expedition, it went on to have a long and successful life as a dependable upper stage, for instance for sending probes to Venus and Mars. That leaves the LK lander. While it never made it to the Moon, three test flights were conducted with prototypes called T2K, designed to test the Block Y propulsion element. Those tests proved that the LK lander's engine could restart multiple times and they also simulated several flight anomalies. After the successful tests, the LK lander was deemed ready for crewed flight. 
But by this time it was already 1971 and the Soviets had lost the race to the moon two years ago. The four failed test launches of the N1 sealed the fate of the Soviet moon landing program and the LK lander was cancelled. While there were 17 missions designated Apollo, only 9 of them went to the moon and only 6 of those landed on its surface. It still is a monumental achievement and we haven't been able to replicate it since more than half a century ago. But that might change in a couple of years, so let's quickly talk about… Future Moon Missions Our closest neighbor in space has been back in the focus of space exploration for many years now. NASA wants to build a permanent presence at the Moon with their Gateway Space Station and multiple private enterprises have attempted to land autonomous vehicles. There have been successful landings by India and China and NASA is currently financing a new round of landing vehicles to get people back to the surface of the Moon, one of them being SpaceX's gigantic Starship. While I don't believe we are going to see a successful new Moon landing before 2030, it will happen in most of our lifetimes. And I hope it will again ignite the spark for the next generation of space enthusiasts to come up and go out there and explore even further. Exciting times and I can't wait to live to see it. What's also exciting is more content from creators you like. As I said, I put some bonus footage from my Apollo and N1-L3 missions in Kerbal Space Program up on my Patreon and for my YouTube members. And if you decide to support me even further, your name will show up here together with all these wonderful people. Thanks guys, I really appreciate it. There is also a time-lapse build of this LK lander model available if you're into that kind of thing. So what are you waiting for? Check out my Patreon and YouTube membership, links are in the description. When this video is going public for everyone, I will be in Germany for the Space Creator Day 2024, so I might not be as quick when reacting to comments as I usually am. But I will get to them, don't worry. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel for more and follow me on my social thingies. The links are in the description. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.